<laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know how to bring it back from that, if I'm honest. What do we? I mean, we can just keep <laughs> going. We can just make a list. <laughs> do you know what? Let's go. Hello. How are you? Hi. I'm very well, thank you. How about you? Good, I'm good, thank you. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Shah from Team Tandon and I'm joined today uh, by Joanna Hedwa, who is the author of Your Love Is Not Good. Um, and we're going to be doing a read-along for this, uh, which is starting this week, I think. Um, so yeah, do you want to give us a introduction to yourself and the little uh, very quick elevator pitch for the book? Yeah, um, I started writing this book in 2014. 20- 14 which is like I can't believe it Um, (laughs) what a labor of love uh, (laughs) yeah I'm feeling a lot of feelings at the moment um the original I guess elevator pitch was more to myself because I had never written a novel like this before and the idea I had was that I wanted to start with a character a first person narrator who at the DMV or the consensus, we would check the same boxes in terms of identity. So yeah. white mother, Korean father, born and raised in LA, poor as dirt, queer as fuck, <laughs> like kink, 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 went to art school, student yeah. debt, want to be somebody. Um, <laughs> I'm, and, in my head, I'm like, check. Yeah. Check. <laughs> you know. um, but then... Basically, I wanted to put this character in situations where anytime she has to make a choice, I wanted her to do the thing that I ethically disagreed with or I politically disagreed with um, or that I did not do in my own life. And I think part of that was because I wanted to write a tragedy and I was really into this definition of tragedy that it's where you watch a character make the wrong choice because there's no other choice. And the part that gets, you know, heartbreaking is that often they think it's the right choice. Yeah. So I wanted to see what I could do, how I could kind of feel into. um, I mean, fiction, I think, is a really good way to do this, to kind of reach into this, like what could have been, what could have been different. Um, So, yeah, I've been saying that it's sort of like anti-auto fiction in this way. Yeah. And so when you, sorry, we're going off, off off script a little bit, but I just, when you talk about sort of making the, the wrong choices and that was an intentional choice, how did you think that your readers were going to sort of react to, to that? Well, I wanted to deal with things that really made me politically uncomfortable and ethically uncomfortable. And I thought that it would be useful to do that with readers. Like, I think that fiction, I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about with fiction is something I saw um, Deborah Levy say once. Deborah Levy is one of my absolute favorites. Same. The, the, her, um, like the living biography. Oh, I'm obsessed. I love them. Yeah, I adore her. I've read all of her books many more than once. And I saw her give a talk like on YouTube and she was saying that fiction is a wonderful home for the reach of the mind. <laughs> and when she <laughs> and when she said this, she was like reaching into the air and then she <laughs> made a fist like that. Love- and yeah, like queen, right? Queen. But <laughs> I think about it often because this motion like that she was doing always reminds me of like fisting. And I feel like in fisting, you know, it's good to wear gloves. <laughs> and I feel like if this is the reach, you know, that fiction does, like maybe fiction is also the glove. Yeah. Like for reaching into thorny political, ethical, moral conundrums. Yeah, definitely. Like there's something about having it as a container around us that's a little bit easier to take yeah. than confronting it, you know, in real life all, all I the time. I think it opens that door for discussion as well when you can sort of remove yourself from it being a work of nonfiction. Because I think when you're reading nonfiction, sometimes you can almost feel like, oh, OK, so this is telling me something that I need to take away. Whereas when you're reading it in fiction, you can almost ruminate on it and think, 
okay, I'm removing myself from this situation as a reader, but the character's going through that. Yeah. I mean, also, like, you know, my first novel was a first person narrator whose politics were absolutely my own. Yeah. And he just shouted them at the reader for 150 <laughs> pages. And, and so I kind of know what it feels like to write that sort of a book. So there was something interesting about having a character that kind of on paper starts at the same place that I do. Um, but, you know, her choices, I would hope, determine a kind of world that she's in that's wildly different from from my own. And so how did your experience sort of with your with the creative worlds like shape that that novel into what it is now? Yeah, I mean, to be like, I should probably say, you know, the art world that I exist in and work in is really not the art world of this novel. Um, the art world of this novel is the commercial art world. So she makes a living with her work. She makes paintings. She has a gallery. She goes to art fairs. Like, and I should say, like, I don't have a gallery. I've never <laughs> been to an art fair. I don't sell my work. Like, I think I've sold three things in 10 years <laughs> like I've had a day job this whole time it's a very different yeah world but there was something like I always love art world novels and and movies when they come out but I tend to get disappointed in them because I feel like they often just go for the low-hanging fruit of the satire of how outrageous and stupid and ridiculous the art world is yeah I think the more like kind of juicy things question or element to that is like all the people in the art world know that it's outrageous and yet so many like intelligent creative talented visionary people like sincerely search for their life's purpose there yeah despite knowing how it's like a circus yeah um so i i think that i was kind of my attempt was to try to show some more of this um side of it while still doing satire yeah you know 100 percent um do you so we've obviously talked about how your main character is sort of the opposite of you but do you relate to any particular character in the book over another yeah absolutely I relate to Iris Wells the one who calls for the boycott <laughs> um I'm always the one that like joins the boycott and signs the petition. And in my real life, I'm very, um, I do a lot of activist work. And for the majority of the time that I was writing this novel, I did have, my day job was in activism. I worked at a nonprofit. And I feel like one of the things I learned while writing this was that in my life, like in my real life doing activism, I would often ask kind of out of frustration yeah. why someone didn't act politically yeah. like I would be like why don't they join the cause why don't they join the boycott why don't they sign the petition blah 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 and I never really I was just asking it in frustration I didn't really want an answer and I felt like with the novel I was actually asking that and wanting to think about what kinds of answers could exist so I relate the most to Iris, the one that's calling for the boycott. And she's like, all, all of this is nonsense. Like, we have to, like, you know, think about what's going on. And then all of the other characters, I was like, yeah, why wouldn't someone join a boycott? Like, what could be a reason? And not to say, like, there's a judgment on if there's a good reason or a bad reason, yeah. but just, like, actually earnestly asking, like, what could be a reason? That's it. And um, I think in the current climate when there is so much to to act on at any given time there's always something to be petitioning um petitioning for or signing and it's just I think that those conversations are important amongst people that you spend time with and it yeah. is that it's not a judgment call it's just a what is the answer to the question yeah I mean also just if you keep asking it like without really listening for an answer I think you just get infuriated yeah. <laughs> Sadly so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I just felt like I spent 10 years being really furious yeah, about, about all of this. And then it. I was like, I need to try something else in my life to, like... This is not have... working. Yeah. yeah, so I ended up writing this instead. <laughs> Amazing. And would you say that you're, with the, with the characters in the book, are likeable and are they meant to be likeable? Um, And I guess you have a, a favourite. Um... I don't 
don't know about this likable question. I mean, I mean, I think that all of my characters would be a, a good out night out. <laughs> like for sure. Important, important, uh, important to 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 make that clear. They would have a great story to tell you. I think they would all have a great like field profile, which Amazing. is like the kinky queer dating app. Like, I mean, maybe with the exception of like the mom, but um. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to think about their mom being on field. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's like maybe the one that's like shouldn't be on field. But um, no, I mean, I really adore all of them, and like you know, I, I have the, I did the astrology of all of them. I did their favorite songs. I've like thought about what they wear. I've thought about like how their house is designed. I've thought about like if they were down to their last hundred dollars, what would they spend it on? Which so, is a great question. Yeah. What do you do with your last hundred dollars, you know? Oh, I've regularly had to answer that in my <laughs> That is such a good dinner party question. What a good dinner party conversation stuff. Yeah. Well, the other question like that's sort of on my mind about all of them, and it's a question that I often ask strangers, is like, who do you want to get in a fight with? And then do you want to win? <laughs> like a level or... fight or like a fist fight? The fights I... don't have to be with fists. True. But like also, but do you want to win or lose? Which yeah. is another way of asking, like, like you know, what do you like when you lose? Yeah, you know. And so I, I feel like it with takes all of a these... lot to admit that you'd like to lose in in a in a fight to somebody. Well, there are several people that I would love to lose a fight <laughs> with. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, celebrities, celebrities. Yeah. That are bigger than me absolutely certain ones mm-hmm. i'm like just sit on me just like <laughs> with your mind <laughs> yeah with your mind yeah with your mind or, or some <laughs> or other parts <laughs> oh god oh <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to bring it back from that, if I'm honest. What do we I mean, We can just keep going. We can just make a list. <laughs> do you know what? Let's go. Who would you like to lose in a fight to? Well, okay. So there's like particularly a pro wrestler right now who's like kind of burning it up. Her name's Jade Cargill. Ooh, I mean she's she's certainly much bigger than me. And I'm like, I I'm I just want to lose a fight to her. Um I mean, I have to say, like, like the verbal part, like how we're saying, like, there can be fights without fists, like, just sit on me with your mind. Like, there are several people where I would just love for them to tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, like, why something that I maybe think or an opinion that I have is actually woefully mistaken. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would, you know, I would for, frankly love Deborah Levy to tell me yeah. how I'm wrong about whatever it is that I think about fiction. Yeah. That would be great. Um, yeah, those are my two, like a like a physical one and an intellectual one. And not a, a great choices. I think I would caution our audience to uh, tell us who you'd like to lose in a physical and verbal fight too. <laughs> <laughs> which actually segues nicely into our next question, which is, have you ever had a muse and would you be comfortable talking about that with us? Yeah, I've had so many. I mean, I mean, so, so many. And, and I should say, like... I think one of the primary kind of methodologies of like how I get through the day is just by being obsessed with different things. So it's not even necessarily mm-hmm. like a person that I know. Yeah. Um, I tend to fall in like holes where for like several weeks, like all I do is oh. like that thing. And it can be kind of wild. It can be like, um, like all the different Mohawks that Grace Jones has had. Um, like the way that Pierre Bonnard paints cats, um, like knives is a recent one in my in my work. I've been making these drawings that I've been putting in the wall with knives, and like knives are a whole sub. It's like it's different kinds. Of, yeah, yeah, Wide. yeah, yeah. So like you know, I just kind of fall in a little hole about that, and this is it's not the same as a muse because it's not a person per se, but it's definitely like. And like, I do have of inspiration almost. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are people 
there are definitely people I've been obsessed with for for a long time. Like I think the longest one it just ended, thank God, recently was um twelve years, and I didn't see this person for eleven years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a long story. That's we should get long, into it. A long time. Yeah. So what are you? What is your current inspiration pocket? So you still in um, the knives inspiration or? Well, the, yeah, the knives thing was. I have a show opening in Ljubljana. I'm in a group exhibition mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks, and I had to buy a bunch of new knives for yeah. that. I bought twenty five. Oh. Um, and they had a really interesting machete. <laughs> um. Wait, so you just bullet... have a machete in your house? Oh, like. Like dozens. You have dozens like, of machetes in your house. Well, girl, I mean, I had to send them to Ljubljana. <laughs> I love that you just looked down like there was going to be one no, there. There's a big box oh. right there. <laughs> like, like right there. It's just full of knives. <laughs> and what's great about it is like, I go to this, I buy them in this one store in Berlin called, it has a wonderful name, the Trendy Army Store. That's the name. Love that. And the and the boys who work there, they all know me. They call me Madame. <laughs> and I and I go in there with my bad German. I'm like, ich brauche mehr Messe. Like, can ich bestellen? Like, I need more knives. Can I order them? You know. They know what the knives are for. Or do they just not ask any questions? I just say, um, this is for Kunst. Like, this is for art. <laughs> Which yeah, is like a fair you know. What more yeah. do you want? They don't really ask many questions, but they do give me a gift because I pay, I give them so much money. I buy so many. So last time they were like, okay, you get a free knife. Just pick any one you want. And they have like a wall. (laughs) With the knife store. Yeah. Like it's like, it's, it's incredible. And so I was like, well, obviously I'm picking the machete, the big one, if you're giving me one for free. And they were like, feel spas, madame, which means have fun. I am obsessed with this. I love this. This is amazing. No, they're, I love like carrying them like on, on the bus. <laughs> like I have them in my bag. Like how do you get them home? That well, makes- that's, I have to make several trips. I mean, like, I mean, to be quite honest with you, I went on a field date recently <laughs> and I had just come from the knife store. So I had like two dozen in a bag and a bunch of pepper spray because they also give me free pepper <laughs> spray. <laughs> and i told this person i was like just so you know like don't fucking try me with anything because i have this bag full of knives did you have to know if you saw this person again well you know i mean let me let me just speak frankly like at some point he was telling me he was telling me some really boring story about his like job and i was like i'm sorry this is really boring you need to just pick up my bag and go into the bathroom and get on your knees and he was like, okay. <laughs> Love See, that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, anyway. Wow. <laughs> Knives as a current muse. <laughs> Gosh, you just don't think that that's where that's going to go. <laughs> so, this book took you. So this you started this in 2014. Was this is the only thing you're working on, or have you got sort of simultaneous writing projects going on? Or yeah, many, many. The next book um comes out next year in Amazing. fall of 2024. I'm supposed to turn Tell in the manuscript. Anything. Yeah, I'm supposed to turn in the manuscript somehow by June 30th. Um that's an essay collection. It's called oh. How to Tell When We Will Die. It's essays on sickness, fate, and doom. So it will include my writings that I've been doing over the years on illness and disability and care and activism. Um, I have, um, I, I yeah, I have a new solo exhibition opening in LA in October that will also have some knives in it, and I'm working on that at the moment. And then also um, my new record I've been working on. I've been calling it Succubus Folk. Love that. Because I <laughs> weirdly wrote a lot of songs on an acoustic, like a kind of haunted acoustic guitar that returned after being gone for 10 years. Gone where? Um, the guitar was gone. Yeah, the guitar was taken by somebody and none of us knew. It was my family's guitar. Like my dad and I played it. 
And every couple of years, we'd be like, what ever happened to that thing? And we'd be like, I don't know. Maybe it's in the garage somewhere. And then we would just forget about it. And then, you know, nothing happened. And then 10, 10 years passed. And then, <laughs> and then the person who stole it returned it just by leaving it on the front porch last summer. Mm-hmm. Unannounced. And we were like, hey! They're, they're yeah! Ready. That's yeah. odd. Yeah. So I was playing it a lot in LA this winter and I wrote like a bunch of new songs about orifices and goblins and things like that. So that's why I was thinking succubus folk. Hag blues. As a genre or as a title? As a genre. Hag blues, succubus folk as the genre. Um, I'm I'm interested. You've you've piqued piqued my interest. <laughs> Great. I mean, you've just told us that you write music you create art you write books and how do you find balance doing all of that um it's really easy I mean I have a kind of annoying answer which is just that I kind of just do whatever the fuck I want I mean it's a bit like the difficult part I think is the getting it into the world part like publishing exhibiting releasing music like that part is still kind of hard for me and it just it's just very disorienting it has nothing to do with the part where I come into this room every day and I'm like what do I feel like doing um and I also think that like I don't really have an answer for how I choose between like genre or form or whatever that would be as interesting as just the question of why this form why that form like that's the same question that I asked myself like what would happen if I asked this you know, question or thought this thought as a doom metal record or as a novel or as a video game or as a sound installation or as a painting or whatever. Yeah. So it's kind of just like that. And then I think it just gets kind of confusing of having to try to categorize it and make it for an audience. Yeah. So with the art that you create in in any sort of medium, is that is everything that you create sort of with the end goal of it being out in the world in some form or is there no you create for yourself there are so many things that I don't put into the world I mean I yeah like one of the things with the drawings that go on the wall with the knives is like I throw out about 60 percent of the ones I make and that's a lot considering that the final like body of work for example in Ljubljana is over 50 works on paper yeah so I like make a lot of shit Like, I just make a lot of stuff all the time. And I don't really, there's a good, like, long period of time while I'm making it where I'm like, this could suck. Maybe I'm not going to show it, you know? I mean, certainly this novel was like that. Certainly this novel was like that. It was very like, this could suck. I don't know what I'm doing. And that persisted for many years. Like, at least five years where I was like, maybe I just won't show this or finish it or give it. Yeah. Wow. And do you have a favorite sort of medium to create in? Um, I do think of everything I do as writing, even if it's screaming in a room or putting a knife in a wall or, I mean, I just think of it as writing because I think of it as like, like writing is language that's embodied. And so the different genres have to do with the different kinds of bodies that I try to find for the language. But I think of it all as writing in some way. And so finally, before you do a lovely reading for us, how does Your Love Is Not Good sort of compare to your other work? If all. I mean, it's it's really a new, it's a really a new genre in the sense that, like my joke is that I spent eight years Googling what is a plot and I still don't know. <laughs> Because I was like in tw- in May, you know, um, I started writing this book in May of 2014. It's almost exactly like nine years ago. I remember thinking like, oh, I'm going to write a real novel. Like it was kind of <laughs> like a fuck you. Like because my first two books were getting rejected and they were very experimental. And I was like, well, I know I can play your game. Like I can write something with a plot. <laughs> I don't have to do this. Don't yeah. tell me. I can write characters that have psychological interiority and change over time or whatever it is that you people want in the literary world. Like it was like that. (laughs) I can write a book that you can produce for the mass market. Don't tell me. 
but, well, but then it was very much like, how do you do that? I mean, it was, I, <laughs> wait, can I? Can I do yeah, that? Yeah, no, maybe not. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's very, very different. And what's funny to me is like me and my friends, you know, all of us are kind of like freaks and outsiders. And, and, you know, to us, like the thing I wrote is like a beach read, you know, but yeah. then like, <laughs> but of course, like I think, to like a more mainstream readership it's like really not and so yeah. <laughs> so I find that very interesting also just like the aim or like you know like I want to try to throw over there and then who knows how close I got to the target you know but it's very different from anything any of my other books for sure um, and so if, if if for you and, and your sort of circle, your love is not good as a beach read, what would you take to the beach if that's so? Oh, my God. <laughs> like, like, I would take, like, E.M. Sioran's, like, A Short History of Decay. <laughs> I mean, I'm a goth. Like, look at me. You know, I'm, like, there. I'm very on brand at the yeah. beach, you know. It's like a Victorian, like a black umbrella yeah. with like a veil <laughs> or some astrophysics book on like black holes or something. Yeah. Again, quite on brand. Yeah, on brand. Yeah. Stunning. Okay, well, I think you have a lovely reading for us. Um, so I'm just going to settle in and uh, leave you to do your thing. Yes. Um, this is it's a very short chapter. Um almost at the end pentimento to modify a painting by applying a very thin coat of opaque paint to give a duller effect hana appears in the doorway of my bedroom she is nude holding a bundle of rope i'm going to need you to help with the ropes she says I wonder where she got those ropes, if she brought them with her from California. Maybe she planned this. She'd thought of our future together. There's an odor to her nakedness. My head swims with it. She wraps the rope around her body, through her legs, down her back, around her stomach, between and around her breasts, over her shoulders, making knots and doubling back, asking me to hold this or that piece pull on this or that end, holding a piece with her teeth while she stretches another, until she is encased in a web of it, all knots and windows tight against her skin. As I pull on them, the ropes lance her skin with red welts, and her body looks like how I'd made it look in Eliza Battle, but had I done it myself, or had she been telling me what to do from the beginning? Here she is in front of me. Hana this, Hana now. She raises her arms to collect her hair and holds it in a mass atop her head. Then she slides a black leather mask over her face. It has small circles of mesh for eye holes and is split by a large gold zipper with shiny teeth that are grotesque in their size. A toothy grin vertically slicing her head in two. Around the head and ears of the mask are more zippers crisscrossing the head into patches, like pieces of the bones of the skull. I stare into the mask, smell its strong scent of skin, then let my eyes fall over her body woven into its net. I think of fish dragged up from the sea, big animals yoked by ropes and diminished by whips. I don't know what to do next. Her voice comes out of the mask. The mask doesn't move. Where's the camera, she says. Right, the camera. I stumble to get it. I am clumsy. I am not the one with authority. I look through the eyepiece of the camera and see her in its frame. It looks good, vivid. It's more than just sex and leather, I think, but meaningfully about power and pain and thirst, the debt of want. I know her then, all at once, her right to exist, the bright white light shining from her. She is someone who we look at, black and white, and in this looking, we are taught how some of us, but not all, can dare to be. 
As much as a self can be bought, it can also be stolen. Meaning is slippery. Whatever you want it to be, it's whatever. She positions herself around the room and I take photo after photo. She directs me with short commands. Over here, now here, make this one a portrait. I say nothing. I kneel. Stand over her. Lie on my belly, on my back, beneath her. She turns away, back to me, bends over, leans on the wall. She lies on the floor, on the bed, on her hands and knees, and our choreography is finally in sync. She tells me to sit on the bed. I sit on the bed. She comes close to me, looking down into the camera. The black mask is a hole. She lifts her, stra her legs and straddles me, one leg on either side, like Zanat did. Do you like me like this, Daddy? She says, but her voice is different. It squeaks, and now she's making a whimpering sound. Is this what you want, Daddy? She says. I snap the shutter quickly in a fluster. Is this the kink she was talking about? Really? Daddy, I want you to like me, she squeaks again. Her voice is cloying. It sounds like every straight porn star I've ever seen. She arches her back and now she's wiggling her ass. Daddy, daddy. She starts to rock on top of me. I am snapped out of the scene. I see us from across the room, her little shimmies atop my flat body. Daddy, daddy. Oh, so she is just a straight white girl. You don't like me, Daddy. Have I been a bad girl? Daddy, did I do bad? I understand now. I am repelled by how ordinary it feels and how ordinary it reveals her to be. And she has dared me to want this. Yes, I managed to say, you're very bad. This seems to thrill her, and she wriggles faster on top of me. There's the sharp smell of her B.O., which makes me scrunch my face. Daddy, you need to punish me, don't you? I did bad. Yes, I say, you did bad. You're the one who hurt me the most. She stops wriggling and sits up straight. She starts to tug at the zippers on the mask around the head and pull pieces of her hair out of the newly opened holes. And her head is now the head of a doll, the kind that belongs to a violent child who has cut chunks of hair away. She reaches over me to her nightstand. Here, use this, she says. Her normal voice is back, flat and hard, and she is pushing something into my hand and I see that it's a lighter. What? I say. Use it to burn my hair, she snaps, all the simpering drained out. And get the shot when the flames are tall. She pulls more hair out of the holes in the mask. You want me to burn your hair? Maybe I was wrong. Then I'll look like you, she says, and starts making a grunting noise through the mask. I understand that she's laughing. I hear in it a pure and cutting sound of contempt. She is tricky and strange and changing, and I am mislaid. Did she simper for me? Is that what she thinks I want? I put the camera down and feel an appalling confusion. Maybe I don't know her or myself or anyone. I fumble with the lighter. Drop it. Come on, you're ruining it. Her voice is harder. She reaches over with irked swiftness, pushes the lighter into my hand. I feel that my palms are wet with sweat. The lighter is a silver zippo, cold and heavy. She wraps her sticky hot fingers around mine and clicks the lighter on. Still holding my hand, she guides the flame to the ends of her hair. Get the camera ready. Don't miss the shot, she says. Come on, look at me. She taps her hand on my face. I can't remember if it was my forehead or my nose or my cheek, but I remember she taps it hard enough to be a slap. Yes, it was actually a slap. There was a viciousness to it that I've tried to forget, like my mother, like the woman on the street, 
like who I was with Leah. And then she says, this is my fantasy, not yours. But as I am telling the story now, I want to change the word fantasy to art because it sounds better, gives her more. That was absolutely stunning. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. No worries. It's been a, a real pleasure. Um, and that is it. Uh, read along for Your Love Is Not Good will probably be live by the time we post this interview. Um, so we can't wait to hear what you think. And yes, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.